Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill and we have a very special guest today. I have Mr. David Harper who is here uh, Zooming with us from England. And those of you who are in uh, Britain in the Commonwealth, etc., may know about this gentleman, but nonetheless, he has come to he is an antiques expert who has come to join us today. David, welcome to Vintage Car History. Bill, it's a great delight to be here. I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a subscriber to your channel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, for, for those folks that aren't familiar with uh, the various antique shows on the BBC, could you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us a bit, a bit about yourself. OK, well, yeah. So BBC antique shows, very popular all around the world. 57 countries, I believe, the BBC shows get sold to. Just so you know, I don't get any repeat fees, Bill, by the way. Oh, I get what I know. I want to grumble about that. All 57 countries, they dub me in different languages. Anyway, so, yeah, bargain hunt. Antiques Road Trip, and I think Antiques Road Trip must be one of your favourites because mm -hmm. it involves old cars driving around the British countryside, tiny little roads in old vintage classic cars, buying antiques in an attempt to make some profit, which we rarely do, but who cares? It's the journey <laughs> bill that counts. <laughs> Well, you're right. And I, uh, I, I am a fan of the show and I, uh, as well as, you know, Flog It and Bargain Hunt and all of those celebrity yeah. antiques road trip, etc. cetera. I, I do watch them on, even though I'm, I'm a Yankee. Well, not really <laughs> a Confederate, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, I know you are, you know, recognized as an antiques expert, uh, you know, you know, internationally and, you know, how did you get into antiques? What inspired you to become, you know, an antiques dealer and expert? Well, you know what? It's about history. And that's something I know you're interested in, your car history. It's <laughs> all about history. And I discovered when I was about five years old that I could handle an object, an, an old object given to me by, you know, a granny or my parents or loaned to me. And I used to feel that this thing was the closest I would ever get to traveling back in time. So if I even handled an old penny from the 19th century, I would look at it for hours and weigh it and smell it even, close my eyes and feel it. And I used to sense that that was a way of me connecting with people in the past. So it was the history side. And then I just discovered that I could learn so much about the past by handling objects. And then I got a, you know, I, I gained an equal love of the object as I did of the history that that object could tell. So from the age of five, I'd be, I know it sounds very boring, I should have been doing other things, you know, handling, collecting, uh, researching, and then from about the age of 18, dealing in antiques. And then some years later, foolishly, local radio rang me and said, would you like to talk on radio about antiques? I did, and it changed my life. I moved into the world of media, and here we are. And here, and here you are. Now you're, you know, a, a BBC antique sensation. And I'm on your show. And, and, and I know. I mean, it's like, why would you be here? <laughs> but, you know, and, and antiques experts, of course, you know, there's a broad knowledge that you're, you're all going to have. And then there's going to be very specific areas of expertise, you know, like Anita Manning. I mean, she knows her jewelry, you know. Yeah. Paul Laidlaw, he knows his militaria. He Philip does. Cyril, he knows his dead armadillos. <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> You know, so what is your what you would call think your specialty is and what drew you to that specialty? Hmm. OK, that's a, That's a very interesting question. And I think for me, it, it's got to be furniture. That was my first love as an 18 year old dealer. I bought and sold antique furniture from a specific period. And it's the Georgian period, 1714 to 1830, a period that very much encompasses America. And I have mm -hmm. lots of connections with America, lots of family then I've lived for some short periods of time in, in Florida. So America and Britain, Georgian furniture. I, I, that period in time to me was absolutely fascinating. A great explosion in inventions, the Industrial Revolution. You know, the Americans and the British and the Europeans changed the world forever and for the better. 
that time of modernity. And we wouldn't be talking if it wasn't for the Industrial Revolution. You know, George Stevenson, one of my all time heroes from that period, who who was born, by the way, about 30 miles away from where I am in in County Durham, England. He, the man that had no education whatsoever, was a a genius, an engineering genius. And he and he created, built the very first steam train in 1825. So, so much was going on in that period. And it's the furniture from that period that I still love and was my first love. But I think to get into TV, you can't just be a furniture expert. You have to have a broad knowledge, broad brush approach. And so over the years, I've I've studied all sorts of areas from Oriental to Art Deco, Art Nouveau to jewellery to watches to cars. And I think The great thing about the world of antiques is that there is so much to know. You'd need a thousand lifetimes to know it all. But there's so much to to know and research that it keeps your brain tickled all of the time. So I'm constantly researching new things. And luckily, that all that information that somehow amassed inside my head, you can go onto a TV show and talk about something. You know, if, if you go into a TV show, BBC, and you're filming and they introduce you to something on camera, you've got to come up with something, Bill, immediately. You've got to tell the viewer what is that thing. There's no prior preparation. You've got to do it. And so you you kind of tap into all sorts of, you know, past research. And if you don't know it, Bill, what do you do? You make it up. Ah, yes. I've been getting away with it for 20 years. (laughs) Well, hey, you've been doing a good job of it. And I'll tell you what you said about the Georgian period and its importance. I mean, you're right. I mean, being, you know, I'm a seriously history guy myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, on you know, with the automotive side, I mean, Richard Trevithick, perfect in that. Of course, the section. Cornishman. Um, yeah. He was, uh, yep, yeah, he was Cornishman. You know, a, a mining engineer, and you know, he built the first road-going vehicle on he did. soil back in he 1801. Did. So there's, uh, you know, so much rich history. I think you've you've even written a book about it, haven't you? I have, I have. Well, well, I, I wrote a book called A Romp with the Georgians. It includes a lot of American stories as well. And it's all about funny, it's the funny history. So I guess I do a stand-up show, a theatre show, where it's just me, one man, we talk about history. And it's just telling funny stories about real people from that period who were actually remarkable. I mean, we wouldn't have cars. We wouldn't have, you know, a, a much longer lifespan. We wouldn't have modernity. We wouldn't have democracy if it wasn't for these people who literally fought and died for it during that period of time. So yeah, I'm a big flag waver for the Georgians, British and Americans who literally changed the world for the better. And they, they do get criticized a lot these days. So, I, I, but, but I take the, the counter view, come on. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't even have the internet. If it wasn't for the industrial revolution for goodness sake. So yeah, history, antiques, they go hand in hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every antique you hold, you're holding history, as you said, you know, you are exactly you you are. It's great. And there are a lot of things that are, of course, part of that history that are antique to cars, specific components to cars, uh, accessories, different objects, you know, hood ornaments, as we call them in the U.S., you know, you you know, the steering wheels, the the foot warmers, you know, the carriage warmers, you, you know, the trunks. You know, yeah. originally trunks were literal trunks and yeah. th- there's there's so many objects that are in the antique world that you you know you'll you can find in an antique shop or in a swap meet or in a boot sale um you know what are some of those that you you feel are good buys and are, are great collectibles well all of those things anything uh, you know attached to a vehicle I- i've got a good example of something here you, you refer to these as hood ornaments We in Britain call them car mascots. Ah, So the thing that would decorate the hood or the bonnet, as as we would refer to it. And this is one of my favourites. I've had him for a number of years. And he's called the Laughing Policeman. And he was made in 1921. And he'd sit on the end of your bonnet, of your hood. And he would travel at 70 miles an hour. So these things are very desirable, just now used as ornaments. But you're right, even luggage, you know, they can't, travel luggage that was designed specifically for a particular car, either to go on a back rack or to fit in the boot or the trunk, as you would call it in in the States. Anything that was once connected to a motor car is desirable. So from steering wheels to clocks, in fact, clocks, 
very much so. I have a, a friend of mine that I, on my channel, uh, mm. film with regularly. He's, a, he's one of the best known watch experts in Britain. And we regularly film watch videos. And watches and cars are so connected, it's untrue. And recently, he had a pair of uh, timers out of a, an Austin Mini rally car from the 1960s made by Hoyer. And he sold them for a small fortune because they once lived inside the dash of a little rally car in the 1960s. They were never going to a car again. But the guy that bought them just went crazy for them. And they now live in his living room. <laughs> so they're just timers out of a car. So, yeah, cars and history and objects, big, big news. And the prices for those things, like cars, have only gone in one direction in recent years. Oh, yeah. The the market is, is right now, it's crazy. You know, COVID just yeah. drove the market. It, it, it did. In a crazy weird way. But we didn't pre predict that, though, Bill, did we? No, no because, we, you know, when, we, we, thought, we, we thought the world was going to end. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. But car prices went like that. Yeah. Watches went mad. Everything went mad. And I think because, I, you know, it's a human condition. You think, hang on a minute, blow it. The world's coming to an end. I've got some money in the bank. I'm going to go and buy myself a Mustang. If I'm going to go, I'm going to go in style. And I think that's what happened. Yeah. Or if I can't, if I can't go to work, if I can't uh, interact yeah. with people, let me get something I can do at home. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just while you're there, Wendy, I'm just going to get Wendy to pull this blind. Wendy, are you there? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for people who are watching. I know I look like I'm absolutely illuminated here. Would you mind terribly pulling that blind down? Yes. I mean, it's obviously depths of winter here, but we're in a, in a, the, the sun is so low. I'm going to be getting dark shortly. They, they, that's it. Thanks, Wendt. Brilliant. Am I too dark now, Bill, or am I okay? Oh, no, you're fine. Brilliant. Can you turn that light on, Wendt? <laughs> Glamorous uh, assistant. Thank you. The Glamorous assistant. You've seen her on the show, on my show, on my channel. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, you know, the making it, uh, getting it right show. Getting it right. Yes. Getting it right. Yeah, I, I love that show. And I like that you can interact with the audience. You know, yeah. you know they can even uh, be selected to win a copy of your book. They can, they can, yes. if they're lucky. Yeah. Okay. If they're not lucky, uh, I mean, I'll put a link. They get a signed one. So you can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, let's go to an antiques uh, road trip because, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of different antique cars that you drive, a classic yeah. car. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys don't get, you know, pre World War One, you know, no. okay, because uh, that could be a little scary, but you've driven a lot of them. So my question is, out of all the different cars you've, you've driven on antique yeah. road trip, what car is the Wow. That you wow. That's a very interesting question and an unusual answer, you might think, because I've had all sorts of cars, Bentleys, Rolls Royces, Porsche 911s, Jaguars. I love all of these models and I've driven them all on the Antiques Road Trip over 12 years. Everything from a Lamborghini Mura to a, a Rolls Royce Corniche convertible. Mm. But my favorite car of all time on that show is something that I never would have predicted. And it was a 1979 Aston Martin Lagonda. Do you remember the big wedge, the big yeah, yeah, lump of monstrosity? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was just written off by the trade for years. You could buy them for buttons. They were just not rated. And when I got this car in Scotland, I mean, I don't know if you've been to Scotland, but the roads in Scotland are even smaller than the roads in England generally. And these old coaching roads, I was driving through the highlands of Scotland in this big Aston Martin wedge lump of a thing. But I promise you, it was like driving a magic carpet. It was marvellous. I loved it. So I surprised myself. Aston Martin Lagonda. It was a whole new world. <laughs> it is, it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, I, I've never driven one of those myself. You know, Highly recommend. You don't get a whole lot of those out in the US as it is. I don't think you do. I don't think you do. And they're very rare here as well, I've got to say. Mm, okay. But when it comes to, you know, a classic car, I know you're, you know, you're not into, you know, the, the real old, you know, brass era cars. But yeah. If you could, money's no object. Right. You could own any automobile, mm. any era, no cash. It's, you know, grand, grandfather above is writing the check. What okay. car would you own? Okay. I think without hesitation, and I've had <clears> them <throat> all 
kind of modern version of it. So a few years ago, I owned a Bentley Azure. You have them there, same model. It's the big Bentley Continental two-door with the, with the, the roof, roof chopped off, so the convertible version. And it, it wasn't a fortune. I made some money on it, actually. I, I drove it for a year or so. Had a, I had some repair bills, but even taking them into account, I made money. But the 1960s version of that, which is the Bentley S3 Continental, say a 1963 convertible. I mean, it's like a big old convertible bus. These things are enormous. But for me, so characterful. And that would be my dream vehicle. And I think I'd probably need a couple of hundred thousand pounds to buy one. No, so I would, doubt I'd get one. Gonna pay for yeah, it. help me, help me, please. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah big old Bentley oh beautiful and you know there's a, a lot of the people that watch you know my channel as well as watch your channel as channels because you have several YouTube you're building some YouTube channels etc yeah. um, what advice would you give to anyone that wants to purchase either a classic car or an antique you know what what do you think is the right the right way to approach it Okay, I think buying a classic car is very much like buying a watch or a painting or a piece of furniture that you're going to live with. So you've got to buy what you love, not what you think you're going to make money on. I think when people try and make money out of these things, they often fail. So buy what you love. And you'll probably agree with this. Most people that buy their first classic car, they generally buy something from childhood either something that when they were 17, 18, they couldn't possibly afford, now they can, or something that they remember, you know, driving around with mum and dad and passing on the road and it just being like this exotic thing. So, so they often buy a little bit of childhood memory. And I think that is a great idea. So if you want to buy a classic car, think back in your head, go back in time. What did you long for when you were a kid? What posters were on your wall? Buy that. Buy a little bit of your past and it will give you double pleasure. Mm, absolutely. Well, those were the questions that I had for you. Okay. Uh, however, I'm certain you probably have some comments you'd like to make. So take it away. Okay. Well, I think your channel is great. I love it because oh, my you. understanding of cars, and I come from a family of real petrol heads. You know, we, we all have lots of vintage and classic, well, what we call vintage classic cars, post-war, post-1945. Mm -hmm. I don't have a great understanding of pre-45 and the early days of motoring, but I love your channel because this is your passion, isn't it? The very early days. Oh, yeah. So I'm learning, learning from you. So I will be picking up knowledge from your channel that I will then transplant onto the BBC without giving you credit, Bill. Okay, well, thank you. But at least it's getting there because if you love history, if that's your passion, it's not about credit. It's about getting the history out there so it's not forgotten. I love history. And, and it's something that you know, we, we need to celebrate our history much more. Yes. We're living in a time where history, in my opinion, has often been rewritten or manipulated. And I think we've got an awful lot to shout about and positive things. And our history really did change the world for the better. And we're talking about motoring as well as everything else. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm a great advocate for that. And I adore it. And there's nothing funnier than history, nothing more interesting. You couldn't make it up. <laughs> it's brilliant. I mean, I've written a book about it. I make money out of it. But, but I've heard other people's stories. You'd, if you saw it in a movie, you'd think that's the, the, the worst plot in the world. That wouldn't happen. But no. It did. It, it did in the past. <laughs> and the past, they say, was a different country. They did things differently there. Mm, right. They're, they they didn't have the same type of political correctness that we do today. No, that's right. You cannot judge the past on today's way of thinking. No. It is a recipe for disaster. Yes. Well, we are definitely in agreement there. Uh, David Harper, I again, I thank you for joining us today on Vintage Car History and uh, you've been a, gr uh, a great guest. You're obviously practiced at this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I love talking cars, antiques, and history. Do oh, it all day long. <laughs> oh, great, right? Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next, next week. Cheers.